And you talked about you just lose control of it all. You try to keep it all yeah. together. And I can't even imagine what that's like to be in the limelight. And then you're struggling with addictions. But everybody thinks this you're a super athlete, super guy. And you've got this dirty little secret. And then it all blows up, right? Like yeah, in your that's, case. Yeah, that's definitely what- that's definitely that's, what happened to me. Like I would, right. I would like all build up, all build up, all build up. Then I yes. go out one night, then I get all messed up, stay out for two days, yeah. And then let it all, let it all come out that way. Like you know. when I stepped on the ice, I never backed down, and I never stayed down. And I was vicious, <laughs> and I was malicious, and I don't care. <laughs> All right, there we go. All right, Kevin, uh, welcome to the podcast. Uh, Today, Kev, I have a new co-host, Anita Astley. She's a licensed individual, couples and family psychotherapist with over 20 years of experience. Uh, She's also an author. She just wrote a book called Unfuck Your Life and Relationships. It's available on Amazon. I want you to introduce you to Anita Astley. Kevin? Hi, Anita. How are you? Good, Kevin. How are you? Pleasure to meet you. And thank you, Chris, for that great introduction. No. Uh, very nice to meet you and very nice to be on here as your co-host. So let's get it on. Yeah, awesome. let's get going awesome. here. So, yeah. so Kevin, listen, uh, we certainly, we have a personal re- relationship. I've known you over the years. We played against each other. You, we kind of crossed over. I was near the end. You were at the beginning yep. of your career. And I, I want to go back to, you know, you're born in Brockton. You grew up in Pembroke. I want to go back to those childhood years and talk about what it was like growing up in Pembroke, the sports you played, and just how was your life back then? Yeah, I, like um, life was pretty good back then. You know, obviously, growing up in Pembroke was a good little town back down here in Massachusetts in the South Shore. And, Next, you know this area kind of down here. So it was, it was great. I was, I was the only boy. I had two two older sisters, and we, um, it, it, it was a great growing up. I played. I was baseball, hockey, and and football. Back then, we could play three sports. Right? It was like you know, you could. When it was football season, I played football. When it was baseball season, it was baseball. Then hockey season, hockey. So I, I played all three sports. I played basketball too. So it was a little bit of everything. And like I said, I love where I grew up. I grew up in a little town in Pembroke, in a little cul de sac, and. Played a lot of street hockey, a lot of, you know, the neighborhood stuff was was great back where I lived. You know, we were able to, um, you know, you, you walk out of your house and next thing you know, you get 10 of your buddies out on the street, you know, together and we could play. That doesn't happen anymore. Everything has to be set up. And But, yeah, but growing up down here was, I love where I live. I still live in this area, so it's, it's great to be down here. But I I love my, my childhood was, you know, was awesome. I had, uh, you know, just a middle, middle-aged, you know, I mean, middle-income family, you know, just, just you know. Did, did everything we had to do to survive, just, you know, regular family. It was, it was great. I really enjoyed my uh, my childhood down here. It was awesome. So playing playing those sports, Kevin, those three different sports, apparently you had an opportunity with the Blue Jays. You could have played baseball, but apparently you weren't the best hitter, so you <laughs> chose, chose hockey. That's what hockey. was, uh, again, playing minor hockey in Massachusetts, and what, what drove you to – the game of hockey as opposed to the other sports. Yeah, I think, I think it just kind of happened next, you know, it was one of those things that just kind of, I kind of rolled into it when I was playing, when I was younger, I was playing, you know, a lot of baseball and, you know, I could, at the younger age, you can always hit because no one threw your curveballs and sliders. They weren't throwing you hundred miles an hour, 85 miles an hour. They could change speeds and stuff. So all that time was fine. But then when I got to college, when I got to Boston college, I actually was going to try to play baseball, but, but after the hockey season, went into the baseball season 10 games, you know, so we, I wasn't able to, you know, there was no spring training. So I would have had to jump in as a freshman and try to play baseball at BC. At that point, I had no, I, there was no way I was going to be able to do it because I wouldn't have a spring training. I wouldn't have anything. And uh, so I basically, um, that's how my baseball season came, career ended because it was at college where I, I thought I was going to be able to try to play as a freshman. I didn't, I couldn't do that because the hockey season ran into the baseball season. So, so 
<clears throat> Kevin, can Go I ask ahead, you? Anita. Yeah, because you, you know, we skipped over the whole, you know, you asked a really good question, Chris, about childhood. I'm like, wait a minute, Chris is turning into a therapist now. What's going on? Right here? <laughs> <laughs> so, Kevin, let me ask you, because I did watch your uh, little, your movie on YouTube called Shattered. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I was very much impressed with the cohesion in your family in terms of, yeah. you know, I listened to your sister talk a little bit about mm-hmm. Uh, how you grew up and the different games that everybody played in the family. Tell me a little bit more about that dynamic, because that's a lot of competition that might be a lot of pressure for some people, but you just seem to roll with it. Of course, you're naturally talented in these yeah. areas from, you know, I'm listening to you yeah. and I watch some of your videos. Tell me a little bit more about that. What was it like to grow up in a family that's so in- athletically inclined and having to deal with all of that with yeah. your siblings and parents? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, um, it was just, it just kind of happened, you know, there was no pressure yeah. back then. It wasn't like, there's, there's a lot more pressure in the kids' lives these days, you know, back when we, I agree. when we grew up and yeah, I think, I think the pressure wasn't, there's no pressure. I just went out and, you know, we, 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 you know, we got up, we went to school, I came home, I saw my mom, we went out and played and, I, and I, there was no pressure to do anything. It wasn't like, you know, these days, Not today. there's so much right. pressure on these kids, you know, it's, it's like crazy, you know, and for me. It wasn't any pressure. It was just go out and, and do what I do, go play, you know, and just then and play. Then the sports kind of rolled into all of that. And then, yeah. you know, as you get older, you know, as you get older, it obviously gets a little different. But yes. at the younger age, I just kind of like, I just played, you know. It was, it was as, as the seasons came on, I had a baseball. I just went to the games. And I just enjoyed it. I never, never thought of anything. I just mm-hmm. played, you know. I never thought of pressure. I never thought of any anything that, you know, obviously, I put pressure on myself at a young age because I wanted to, to be excel. good at those ages. Too. Yeah. You know, I really wanted to be good. You know, so it's kind of you, you kind of put your own pressure, but you don't even know when you're putting pressure on yourself, you know, because you don't know what pressure really is, you know, at that until later age. on. You know, you so when, really, yeah. When was it go apparent ahead. that hockey would be your 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 career? It would. It's well, the sport well, that you would go really to really apparent until, Yeah, it wasn't really apparent until like junior in high school where I got um. I got a scholarship to go to Boston College, and it was kind of like um, to play hockey. And that was like the first time I really said, you know, I'm going to have to be all hockey here. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's a, and that was, you know, nowadays these kids are, you know, 12, 13. I remember my kids 10, 12, 13 years old having to stop playing baseball because they're missing tournaments in the summer to go up, you know, the Foxborough or, or Marlboro to play in these hockey tournaments, which yeah. are crazy, but. There's so much that you talk about pressure, right? There's so much pressure on these kids to play in these tournaments because there's going to be scouts there. They're saying, you know, all, right. garbage, you know, all the garbage ducks, they say, you know, you got to play in these things. And all they are is $300 in the guy's pocket. And there's, you know, nothing, you know, it's no scouts. There's scouts there, but there's nothing they can see in the wintertime too, you know. It's not like you're missing anything. But these these people may feel the, put the pressure on those kids and they yeah. talk and, you know, everybody talks and you like you're missing something if you don't get in these tournaments, you know, and it's, it's kind yes. of crazy how that all, all happened because it never happened in my, in my younger days. I just played. Yeah. Well, it, it, yeah. you know, I'm interested to find out what it was like for you too when, cause I look back at my young hockey career, always wanted to play for the Bruins, wanted to play in the NHL someday. I had this dream mm-hmm. and I worked at it. There's no question, but I also have my friends outside of hockey and because both our lives, we have kind of come together through addiction, yeah. um, the two of us. I look back in my younger years, and I, 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 my family of origin, and when, when the drinking started, I was around drinking all the time. Um, it, w- it was kind of normal in mm-hmm. my family and in my neighborhood. But mm-hmm. when I started playing hockey at a young age, too, it got to a point there where we'd go play games, and afterwards we'd go get have some beers and drink beers. Yeah. And then as I got older, it was, it was summer hockey. We play down, hang them and yeah. all of, you know, guys would get together. Was, did you start drinking and stuff like at an early age or when did that yeah. begin? Yeah, I, I really did not. So it was, it was weird. I, you know, I remember drinking. I heard that. I heard BC. It wasn't until you got to BC. Yeah. yeah it, wasn't, <laughs> it, wasn't really, like, it wasn't really, you know, an issue. Like, huh. Like it wasn't even an issue. The drinking never became. It was a. It might have got killed. Like you said, we went to games. We drank. We had your times. You know, we went out and yeah. you know we got yeah you, know, you got fun. Got, yeah, you had fun and you got up the next yeah. day and you didn't drink the next day. Yeah. You just went to right. did your normal day, right? Mm-hmm. So I did that for a long time. When I BC, like when I was in high school, I had a few beers here and there, but I wasn't. I never 
really knew about drink. I never knew anything about addiction. Anyway, I never knew anything that ever you know, crossed my mind. And then when I got to BC, it was just drinking again. I, I never liked the drinking. I never put it in any front of anything. I never like drank consecutive days and like just drank and drank yeah. and drank. You know, I never had but, that yeah. type of problem. You know, I never put it in front of anything until till later in life when I hit addiction, which was at a later age. But at yeah, BC, you know, I you started to party. It was the same thing. Well, after games, celebrating, having a good time with the guys, going out and having fun. It was never really a big issue to I got to 28 years old. Like, you know, but my younger days, it was just normal stuff going out after games, celebrating, you know, never drinking before games. Never like not, nothing happened like I did till I got into the NHL, you know, when I got stuck there a little bit. You know? Got you. But I want to. So I want to also come. make a Chris. I want to make a just share that when parents today think, okay, you know, I'm going to avoid and protect my kids so they don't have to go through uh, something like that with addictions, alcohol. You know, they're trying to protect their children. They think putting them in all these sports is a solution. And I have to talk and work with parents to say, no, that also exists in sports. It's not like if we, we put our kids in games, we occupy them with a certain sport and they're going to be protected. They're not. We still need to have these conversations and keep an eye on what's going on with our kids. Normal drinking here and there, okay. And I believe in healthy exposure. I'm a Canadian, you know. <laughs> in the U.S., we're a little bit more strict about stuff like that. I think healthy exposure, like you were talking about, right? But it's this idea, this notion that if we keep our kids really occupied, but particularly with athletics, they're, they're somehow not going to fall a prey to some of the abuse and the addictions that is very prevalent in sports and how you learn to manage all of that um i just want to ask you a little bit about that kevin if you can share yeah well i i, I really believe like if you have that addiction i really believe like no one's you know finding out all about addiction in the later yeah. life i i feel if you have if you have that gene if you have it and you yeah, activate genetics. it at some point in your yeah. life if you have it like it doesn't pick and choose who has it right some of us have it some of us don't have family you know a family dynamic you get it whatever how we get it yeah. If you have it, and I think if you if you activate it like I did at a yeah. later age, I didn't do any. I never did drugs at all until I was until I was twenty eight years old. Yeah, and that's when my addiction started. You know, that's when yeah. I started to to get that addictive personality or whatever. I might have I had the addictive personality, but to hit hit the you know the skids a little bit and start to think about what's going on and you know how it, it didn't happen until I was twenty eight. So I didn't activate anything. I didn't try anything. You know, I didn't do any drugs. I didn't smoke pot and I drank, you know, and I just, yeah. and I didn't drink enough to put it, you know, I put it, I didn't put it in front of things. So it wasn't a problem for me. I just thought it was normal, you know? Yes. And that was my, like, that was my thinking because I didn't really know. And I think, you know, like you said, people, childhood sports, and, you know, I think people getting involved in sports, it doesn't, you know, it, it's nice that you get involved in sports because it gives you that companionship and that yeah. competitiveness and you, and you meet good people and all that kind of stuff. But if you have, I think if you have it, if you have that gene, I think if you activate it, you're going to be in trouble. You know, it, it doesn't triggered. matter if you're playing hockey. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't matter if you're yeah. playing hockey or walking down the street, but by, by playing sports. So sometimes it gives you that, it gives you a little more time because you, you, you're, you're, you're active and you're doing a lot of different things. You know, yeah. Not, it's you know, it's you know, certainly, game. It certainly, Kevin, uh, feeds into it because I'll just tell you, you know, in my case, getting to the National Hockey League, when I got there, and listen, always when I was in college or whatever, work hard, play hard. That was my, it's that learned behavior I saw at home. My father work all day, come home, have a few cocktails, yeah. work hard, play hard. Yeah. Right. And normal. then, you know, we'd work out and whatever on the house, we'd ripping the ceilings down and we're doing the house over after we're done the day, a couple of beers, work out, play hot. It's normal when I got to routine. the NHL. Yeah. Yeah. When I got to the NHL and we would finish practice every day, we'd go across the street to the tavern and we'd have a few beers. Now, yeah. some guys after those few beers and lunch would go home and some of the younger guys would go out and go somewhere else. So, yeah. That, that that environment I was in in hockey and you were in it it really l lended into yeah um, you know that it fed into that addictive personality yeah. if you yeah. you had those issues you yeah. very well could have got swept up now listen in my own case during the NHL yeah there were nights you know I overdid it but for the most part I was 
I, I, I was responsible. Yeah, I would get crazy sometimes. You know, yeah. after a game, we'd stay out a little late. Night before a game, I might have a couple beers, take it easy. I wouldn't get all messed up. Yeah. But it was such a big part of of my hockey career, drinking. I, I can't – I it's hard to remember days I went without drinking, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's part I, of the culture, I, I, right? I, 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 the, it's part of the yeah. culture. Yeah. Sports I, culture. I, I, I love part that part of it. It's part of our culture. You know, yeah. I, I was – yeah, I, I I I love that part of it. I love going. I love going to work out of practice, get a good workout, and go with fifteen guys, have lunch, and have hang out with the guys. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I yeah, and then we go home and take a nap, and we get up and have dinner and do the same thing. You know, and like you know, that was just part of it. I I don't think they do that now because it's different. Because there's food in the locker rooms. These guys, you know, if I got a bagel in the morning, next that was a lot. You know, these guys yeah, get, really. These guys have a nice omelet. You know. Yeah, we you know we get the co- half a coffee and a, and a half a bagel was a good day, but but you know for us it was you know I was we were the same way we were you know I look forward to that stuff. You look forward to like winning a big game on a Saturday night, right? Like, yeah. like, out. We're at home Saturday night. We're playing in Philly, right? Place yeah. is rocking. Let's can't wait to win this game so we can go out yeah. afterwards and have fun with the guys, right? Yeah, you so- play extra hard, so you, <laughs> extra hard on that ice, so you're like geez, so you go and have a good time, right? Yeah. Uh, so, Kevin, yeah, let me ask you a question. Are, look, yeah, let me ask you yes. a question because you brought up a really good point about addictive personality. You know, we some people have more of an addictive personality than others, and then it just we have different vices to feed that addiction. Whatever you might be, exercise that's healthier than drugs or alcohol. And I, you know, I watched that movie this morning about your life, a very short mm-hmm. version of it, and. I remember being very struck by the moment that you share after a game, you were in Manhattan and that's when you had your first experience. And I would like to ask you, you know, what it was it about that particular night and that experience you think that triggered all of that, which followed you later on in your life? I think I'm not really sure. Like I try to pinpoint what, you know, yeah. What what happened that night? Why it happened that night? I think it could have happened any night. You know, it was okay. just one of those things where, you know, I was not knowing. Like I had no idea. Like the thing is, I had no idea what I was. So I didn't think it was any other night, right? Because I yeah. had no idea what this was going to do to me. So it wasn't like right. I was doing something to try to figure out what was going to what was going to no, happen. To me. I didn't experience. think this would affect my life at all, right? Uh-huh. Nothing, 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 nothing. So I just did it. You know, thinking that, you know, maybe you know, have fun with this person I did it with, you know, just, just the type of things, you know, that, that come yeah. in with it, you know. So it's kind of like, you know, so I was like, yeah, maybe, yeah, I'll try it, you know. And then, then, then but happens. not thinking that, you know, I just thought I was going to jump on the bus and, you know, and then the next day and thing would be fine. But it wasn't. There was a little difference, you know. It was just that, that's what happened. I, I had no idea what was happening, you know. No. That was so what was, I had no clue. You, what it was. So what was the difference? Could you describe that difference? Because yeah, people do recreational stuff that all the night. time, right? They use, they think, oh, I'm okay. Yeah, I don't think but there was, was any. The I don't think there was any different. I don't think the, the difference in how I felt, or yeah. the difference in that night. That night, I had no. There was no difference at all. I didn't. I went out that night just to have a good time. Like yeah. someone handed me that. No, no one's ever handed me that. You know, so I didn't. I didn't really have an ever opportunity to ever do that. You know, so it was. It got to a point where that just happened. That it happened to be that night. You know, could have been. Three weeks earlier, it might have happened, but that was happened that night, you know. So it just that's what happened, and it just it's that night. So that was kind of what what all happened, you know. Right, and then it spills over, yeah. though, um, right? It spills over into yeah, other, it's, another it's, night and another night. Over. Yes. Yeah, it did, and it kept going, it kept going, it kept going, you know. And I do want to actually, you know, it, it, go ahead, Kevin. Sorry. No, go ahead. I just wanted to, before going further, congratulate you, by the way, on your sobriety. You're doing an amazing yeah. job. So we talk about addictions, no, but maintaining sobriety, as you also know, Chris, is the most challenging part because we can live in denial and we can live in that whole world, but to actually confront it and be in recovery and take one day, one step at a time, every day towards remaining uh, clean is most, it's, it's a very difficult challenge. As both of you. Have yeah, there's no question. Yeah. And, 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 you know, when I, when I look back and we talk about addiction and, and, and the things I've read about it and I've studied about it and I've experienced, and we talk about trauma and addiction, okay? Now, yeah. 
Kevin talking about the gene and and having that uh, alcoholic Genetic gene or addictive gene yeah. uh, being hereditary. But when you talk about the trauma piece or the learned behavior piece, but the trauma piece is key because in Kevin's case, um, you know, you go back to that season where Kevin, um, he ended up having a violent collision with another player. Uh, it was back in 1993. Islanders in uh the Penguins in the playoffs, Kevin went to make a hit and he hit this guy with so much force. He, he banged heads with him and he ended up knocking himself out and he fell flat on the ice and his face broke the fall. Yeah. So he shattered his I whole face. So the trauma piece there, when you talk about coming back from that PTSD, whatever it was. Yeah. And Kevin, do you think that was like a big turning point in, yeah. When you talk about the addiction piece in your life and yeah. your yeah, career, I, I think I think it was Knox. I think it was. I you know what the funny thing about it, two months before that accident happened, that's when the first time I tried cocaine, right? So yeah. that was yeah. kind of like that whole sequence was right in that little package, you know. So it was kind of like that was the first time I when I when I when I hit that guy, and I smashed my face in the ice pylon. You know, it was okay. I opened up the can of worms with the with the cocaine, right? I've already kind of like. I got the thing Dabbled. moving a little bit. Yeah, now, yeah I, got, I got this thing going on in my mm-hmm. brain a little bit. What's going on? I feel a little different, yeah. whatever. And then, then this happens, and I'm in the hospital for the next two and a half months. I have surgery on my face and everything. So, And obviously, I needed pain medication, right? So the pain medication came, the pain medication came. But the funny thing about it, at the end of it all, when I came out, I didn't stay on the pain medication, I, but I stayed on the cocaine, you know, it was yeah. like, well, it wasn't like I got on the pain medication later in my life, but, but after this happened, I, I, I stayed, the cocaine was more involved in my life, you know, it wasn't, and then it became a bigger issue. Obviously it got, you know, as we, as we progress, progress, progress into the addiction, right? That's what, that's what happened with the cocaine. It progressed. I wasn't doing it all the time. I was doing once a month, whatever, all at the wrong time. You know, always the wrong time. You know, always putting it. It was no good time. No, no All good right. time. It was always, you know, like like you know, night before games or whatever. Whenever I want, when I it, it's out of control and making the decision. That's when I knew it was controlling me. When I was doing it in times when I would never have ever put it in front of hockey. Mm-hmm. Now the cocaine is getting in front of the hockey. You know, was it difficult? Was it difficult to hide and keep that little oh, part yeah. of your life secret yeah. from your teammates? Oh, yeah. How that's, difficult was that? Uh, that was torture. Nux. You know, that's, that's the hardest thing It's like, you know, it's, it's just, just, just trying to like keep that like away, like how, how I could keep that, like, you know, the, the whole thing, getting on the bus and trying to like be the best player you can be. I'm playing with the best player in the world on the left side, you know, and you have to, you have to perform. Yeah. All you have to do when you play with those great players is play well. You need they, yeah. because they're going to play well that night, you know. So you need to play well. You better be ready to play, you know. So it's kind of yeah. like a, it's 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 you have to be ready to play. So you can't be up, you know, getting you three hours of sleep a night, three hours of sleep, and trying to play at the level of an NHL All Star and trying yeah. to play with these guys and hiding and running. It's the worst feeling. It gives me goosebumps now thinking about you know hiding. I got to hide and run. It's like I hated it. Hiding the shame, the guilt of it. But let me ask you, nah. off the ice, how did you manage it off the ice with your, because you're married, <laughs> with your family? Yeah I, was, yeah, I didn't manage it too well, you know. It was like, you know, it's like it's nice, you know, it's kind of when you, you know, you, you after a game and you, you know, you don't get any sleep and you come home and you say you got great, uh, you tell, you, tell your wife you got good, good solid eight hours when you haven't hit the pillow yet. You know, that was one of, those are always good times when you come home and you're exhausted and you're like, it's just the whole, you know, the whole like the drug addiction is you got to be sneaky, right? It's all about sneaking. You know, it's all about you know, Lying, conniving. Right. It's all about right. you know, getting getting through these angles. You know, to do the best because all you care about is yourself. You know, you're not caring about anybody else. You're caring about how you can survive you can to be effect. a decent hockey player. You're not going to be right. you're not going to be a good hockey player, but you're going to survive to be see if you can still stay in the league and try to be, be the best person you can be. You know, even though you messed up and your brain's all over the place, you know, you got to lie and you got to connive with everybody around. Yes. So there's a lot of, the there's a lot of deceiving going on. So did anybody confront you, your wife or your, anybody in your family? Yeah, say, hey, no, you know, yeah. it's yeah, like know. different. Yeah. Everybody, did they, uh, they, they would say something. You know, obviously they'd, they'd be, they'd be like, 
my obviously my wife was like, you know, she was, you know, she would say, you know, she could see, you know, but she was trying to do the best she could to make me the best player. I could, you know, everybody. So when you're in that hockey world, you, you're trying to be the best player you can be, and everybody's a, a big of part of it, you know. Right. When you're, yeah, and when you're on the top of the world, you need those people to help you, you know. Like when, when I hit addiction, I had, I just won two Stanley Cups. I was a first team All Star. We're going for our third cup, and I decided to try cocaine that night. That was like, yeah. you know, it was the pressure so much that it was the pressure so much that I needed the relief. I kind of think, well, you know, I kind of think of at the end that maybe I couldn't handle, I couldn't handle that pressure. Which I love pressure. You know, I thought I, I thought I loved it, but then I kind of look back and see why maybe yeah. the pressure was too much. I don't know. You know? Yeah. Because that's the only, how, how can yeah. you deal with that kind of pressure? If you're not able to talk to somebody about it, then you go to, people go to substance yeah. and alcohol to deal with that pressure. Yeah. And you don't know it when you're in it, right? Chris, you've been there. I haven't been in that type of pressure, but I can only imagine what it feels like to be watched by everyone, including people that love you and you have to perform and you're this amazing person on ice. You've won two Stanley cups. You got to live that life, but it's not always that great behind the scene. There's a lot of loneliness and isolation. And sometimes the way we cope with that is through substance abuse and alcohol abuse. Yeah. Yeah. No question. And then try to hide it and then deny it. And denial is such a huge uh, part of it. And once you can just admit it to yourself and other people in your life, which you eventually did, Kevin, as I saw in the yeah. film, that, that that takes a lot of courage and strength to get there. And you too, Chris, being yeah. able to say, hey, yeah. I, I have this addiction. It's running my life and ruining my life. Yeah, yeah. well, you know, and I, I, I look at it in my case, like I didn't do drugs when I played in the NHL the, during the season. There were times in the off season where I'd be home in Boston. I'd go out at the bar with my friends and I'd be yeah. out and someone would say, hey, let's do a couple of lines. I'd be like, oh, okay. It wasn't during the season, and I figured, okay, I can stay up another couple hours and uh, and drink, you know. But during the season, I didn't. And mm-hmm. the first time I took any painkillers, which was my drug of choice, was the opiate, was when I broke my arm. I was playing for the Rangers. I broke my arm in Montreal, had to fly home to yeah. New York, so they didn't put a cast on it. Anyway, they gave me Percocet. That was the first time I took it during my career. And it actually made me sick. But yeah. people don't, you know, they think they know who you are and they think they know what's going on. They think they know what it took to get there, but they really don't know what it took to get there. They don't know what it takes to stay there. And yeah. that pressure does at some point come down and and start to really lean on you and you find ways to deal with it. And one of those ways for me to deal with it was was – drinking and that's why yeah. i did drink like after games kev i'd fight <laughs> two three times you know i'd yeah. be back in my hotel room my can't my head's killing me my hands are killing me yeah. i i, I want to i just want to yeah. decompress yeah. and and there were times there yeah i would go out after a game but then i come back to my hotel and continue it until yeah. i you know could fall Passed asleep out. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I agree. Now, because I think you know the pressure. The, it, you know, we think you like the pressure, and we love pressure. You know, we all, you know, we grew up with it. We like playing it, and it's fun and everything. But there is a time when it kind of gets to you, you know, and it kind of like you know takes you. Of course, you, know, you, you gotta you gotta handle it a certain way, right? We all have yes. to, and some people can yeah. handle it, and some people can't. You know, and some people do it differently than others. And I love to have a few beers after the game. Also, I couldn't sleep, never sleep after a game. You know, it was the same way. You know, I was up all night. Yeah, I, even before, like, you know, I remember I used to, my dad used to have to come in for playoff games because I couldn't even go to sleep at all. Like, I used to stay up all night. Like, I couldn't wind down after a playoff game ever, you know? So it was yeah. kind of, you know? Would so you, yeah. Kevin, so would I, you ever yeah, talk I, about, would you ever talk about those pressures with your wife or your dad or somebody in your family? I, I don't know. I, 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 I'm not sure. I ever looked at them as pressures. You know, I kind of liked them. You know, I, 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 didn't, yeah. I never looked at you know, till I till I got out of the game a little bit, and I kind of ended. And I kind of like you know, you kind of see maybe those were the problems, those were the pressures. But I didn't when I was playing. I really didn't look at it as pressure. You know, I just looked at, you know, I'm wound up like a top. I can't sleep. I you know, I, I just Excited, play a huge yeah. game, and you know, and my my emotions are gonna like, and I and I and I think about every play. Sometimes I'm missing a play, missing something, a shot, empty net, or like you know, I mm-hmm. can't let it go. Those are all things that, that I just thought were normal for hockey guys. Yeah. Like everybody thought about the game. You know, we all want to win. We all want right. to, you know, 
do that stuff and it's a game so emotional and I loved every minute of it, right? And when I was in it, I, 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 yeah, I loved every single second of it. You know, I wouldn't have changed a thing. You know, that's no. that's just the way it was. Well, I just, you, that's what I thought it was all about. Yeah, but you underestimate the, now what we look at it and call it pressure, what that does to your body and mind. Because yeah, we no, all need no, to, like, I, I kinda, we all need to step out of our professional self and go into our private self and yeah. be able to calm ourselves down and soothe ourselves. And Unfortunately, you know, those, when you're in the limelight like that, uh, yeah. it's, it's much more difficult yeah. to have that time. Chris, you talked about that, you know, the yeah. isolation, and the loneliness, yeah. you're the most popular guy. And then you end up alone in your room and you're trying to debrief and deal mm -hmm. with every, every play, every mistake, every win, and you're trying to break it up and kind of go through it over in your head, but you're alone. You talked about that yeah, well, last it, time we it, spoke of it, the it, isolation of it, yeah. of fame. Well, you uh, Listen, you do what you you got to do what you got to do to survive, if yes. you will. Yeah. Not only you want to excel, but you also have to survive. Like, and there was a part of my game when you're fighting all the time. Yeah. Um, that in my own head, I'm there. I can't slow down because if I slow down fighting, the exit is pretty close. So I had to right. stay on top of that part of my game. And there is a lot of time. And I love that part of my, my game. I love being able to stick up for my teammates. I love doing that job. But it certainly was at times lonely. It, you know, the nights I was having a tough time, I didn't go to, if Kevin was my teammate, say, hey, Kevin, uh, I'm having a Nobody tough time. Nobody talked to each other, right? Yeah. <laughs> can you, can you, you burp me and change my <laughs> diaper? Right. Can you burp me and change my diaper, no, Chris, please? I wanna, wait, um, I want to, can I want to say that, Chris, you're what? using the language. Go right you ahead. No, the language and the words you're using it is implication that you're a baby. Wah, wah, wah. That if, you know, you, the hockey player, would talk yeah, but about that's the, being a that's baby. That's the whole gang. thing with hockey. But no, well, you, well and, and, you have yeah, to be hockey, that macho. It's right. all the, in sports, in all the you've sports, got to have that macho absolutely. edge. You can't but show weakness. But it doesn't weakness. work. It doesn't work, as you know. It works. Kevin, it, as works. You know. it works on and, the eyes, okay? And yeah, then off but the when eyes, you're off, it doesn't. I get that. It doesn't work. And then, of course, it starts to impact you know, your performance as, you know, when I watched the movie, Kevin, I thought, okay. And you talked about, you just lose control of it all. You try to keep it all yeah. together. And I can't even imagine what that's like to be in the limelight. And then you're struggling with addictions, but everybody thinks this, you're a super athlete, super guy, and you've got this dirty little secret and then it all blows up. Right. Like yeah, in your that's, case, yeah, that's definitely, what, that's definitely that's, what happened to me. Like I would, right. I would like it all build up, all build up, all build up. Then I yes. go out one night and I get all messed up, stay out for two days. Yeah, and let it all let it all come out that way. Like you know, let the whole world, you know, let my whole body. Like I, when that happened, I can t I can tell now. I could just like, yeah. and I can finally let it out, and all the wrong ways, the wrong way to do it. Absolutely, right? I was doing all the wrong things you know, to do it, and that's. But once I did it, I kind of needed to do it. It was like at that point, I was at that blowing point that I, you know, yes. I, I needed to get out and do something unless I was going to explode. I didn't know how to handle it. That's Absolutely. that's that's okay. why I made the big mistake. You know. Well, I well, mean, it, ultimately, you know, it's your body and mind's way of saying, dude, I'm done. You cannot beat me any further. And that we cannot deny right. the link between the body and mind connection. You beat both parts of yourself up. And the only way to go is up, up right? I mean, I looked at, I was listening to the stories and I thought the last story that you shared of the FBI and that was the worst moment of your life, but it was actually the best moment of your life because the only way right. to go from that point was up. And I was very struck by your relationship. I was talking to Chris about it with Mario Lemieux. I think, wow, you know, the relationships that you've had in your life and and you've built all of those throughout your career and your life that he was he seemed to be a very pivotal person in your journey and your story to where you are today, giving you not only one chance, but multiple chances yeah. because he saw something inside of you. You have this great connection. And I always think, you know, I'm all about relationships, irrespective of yeah. whatever it is that you're doing in your life. It is ultimately yeah. these relationships that we nurture and build that get us through the most adverse aspect and parts of our yeah. life in our journey. And yeah. I was really struck yeah. with that relationship with Mario that you had. Yeah, I, I think I think you know the the rest of what Mario builds for life, the stuff we had to do on the ice, right? So you yeah. so you're in pressure pressure situations all the time, and yeah. you look at him and he looks and we lean on you lean on each other for for yes. help and for support, right? To do the right thing, and especially on the ice, right? So we can go out and 
and, 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 and you build that like silent chemistry. It's not even like right. you don't even have to say anything. You know, it's not like you know, Mario wasn't a good uh, big speaker. He didn't he didn't tell me stories. He didn't tell me what I was supposed to do, how I was supposed to do it. But every time right. I needed help with, with the addiction stuff, he stepped up to the plate. You know, it's like I didn't ask him. I didn't like you know. It wasn't like I was he looking knew. for her support or anything yeah. like that. It wasn't like I talked to him all the time. It was yeah. like any time he just we just built that relationship that we had. Yes. That whenever he was asked to help, he helped. You know that that that's that, that means a lot. You know he's he's yes. one of those guys that, like I said, we don't talk every day. It's not like he's you know no. right down the street. We you know go have a, have a sandwich. You know, but anytime I was he needed to step in and help me, he was there for me, which yeah. meant meant a lot. You know. Yeah, and you know if we could have those kinds of relationships in our lives, they're they are so vital to our uh, mental health and our functioning on a day to day basis. Chris, can you recall relationships that you had in hockey that helped you to get to where you are today? Um, as far as my sobriety and stuff like that. Well, all of it. If we can just confide and talk to someone that's close to us and can um, empathize, well, sympathize on some level. Empathy. Is really I had hard. a teammate that kind of inserted himself into my life uh, yeah. when I was struggling, and not at the time knowing what he was doing. For me, I looked at it, um, you know, he, he presented another way to me. And I, in turn, ended up making a phone call to somebody that he referred me to. Yeah. With him knowing that I was having some issues, not with just, you know, getting a job and starting a new career. But he knew I was having problems with other stuff, substances. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't really aware of how much he was uh, in tune to that. And he really helped me. And the guy was Bob Ganey. He referred me to someone. And and that's that person when I finally mustered up the strength uh, to make a phone call and ask somebody for help. That mm -hmm. was the guy mm -hmm. I, I ended up calling. So, yeah, those relationships we make um, in hockey and, and through the guys we play with are invaluable. And it's. Again, and we talked about that earlier, like us guys, us macho men, you know, you, you're playing this sport where you can't have chinks in the armor. You have to, you know, be the hot ass. I got to play hurt. I got to, yeah. I can't go to my teammates and say, costs, oh, you know, right. I'm hurting tonight. I yeah. can't play. Yeah. yeah. And, that, and that's such a big thing in that game. And again, those guys know it. And it's nice that I had somebody kind of direct me and, mm -hmm. and put me in a direction where I was able to get help. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, I, I think, I think the biggest thing is those, those relationships are built before the, all this yep. stuff happens. Right. Yes. So it's like, Absolutely. these guys step up to the plate. You, know, you don't know if they're going to step up to the plate. We didn't, I didn't know. And that's probably didn't know. I didn't know Mario was yep. going to say, you know, take him my plane, let him to go to rehab. Let me, let's try to help him get in there as quick as we can. And, you know, I, you don't know those things are going to happen, but you hope, you know, you have, you build these relationships with these buddies and, and that's what happens. And that's the good thing I like about that sport. You know, you build these mm -hmm. inner relationships that, are, you know, people, after we retire, people go all different ways, right? We all go different. We all go live yeah. where we're going to live, but we have that connection, you know, and people care about other people. You know, you don't see them all the time. You don't talk to them all the time, but you care. You have that care. You always you care about what's going on with the other guy, you know? Yeah, that connection is it's it's nice. It's uh, I don't think it's built. To, you know, I know in hockey, it's in sports in general. But I know in hockey, that's a big bond. That's that's big. You know, it's it's you have that connection with guys. You know, even if you even if you haven't won, if you win, it's even more. I think. You know. So Kevin, like myself, you battled with um, trying to get sober and trying to turn your life around. You know, I had a few relapses myself. Yeah. Um, you were there for one the next day. Um, uh, for me and we we yeah. we were together but and we also ran around together yeah. when it came time for you know trying to get um a drug of choice and and then i kind of got on my horse and you were still struggling a bit and i used yeah. to call you kev how you doing all right you know not yeah. and you're always up front with me which i appreciated but um what do you think, and I remember you talking to me that when you got arrested there yeah. and they stuck your ass in jail yeah. <laughs> and you told me it wasn't, it wasn't Duxbury jail where you get a pillow and a <laughs> fucking like quill. Uh, they stuck your ass down in Rhode Island. Yeah. Did that really, did that 
experience there really kind of grab yeah. you and say, Kev, it's got a yeah. joke here, talk, to, right? talk to us about that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that was, um, that was the time, right? That was when it happened. That was, I don't know why it was time next, you know, because it was, you know, there were so many other times I got jammed up and I got in trouble and like, you know, with the family, with the, you know, you did so many things to hurt people. Like when you're out there running around and like, but this time, was kind of different. Like when they came in and pushed my door in at like five in the morning, they started yelling and screaming. I'm like, yeah, about nothing. It's kind of like I'm sitting there, like, you know, what's going to happen? So, yeah, they, they picked me and I went to jail. I spent seven days in this jail down in Rhode Island. Well, they don't, you know, when I really realized, you know, I needed medication. They don't care about medication. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. No. I said that was the last thing I need. I couldn't even get a pillow or a blanket over my medication. Right. So it was kind of. <laughs> So when I was when I was in there, I kind of learned a lot about you know what was going on, what was happening. But it was just kind of it, that was a, that was a time where I had a really you know I had seven days down there, and I you know I got out for fifteen minutes out of myself. So I spent a lot of time with myself in there, you know, a lot of time thinking about thinking, like you know yeah. what's going on and what's next, and uh, how am I going to get out of this? Yeah, now that was like I think the, the gig was kind of up, you know, it was kind of like. You know, how many times can you keep running and pulling? Well, and you're exhausted, thing, right? I would, I would think that you're yeah, exhausted. You're right. Exhausted. The gig is up. Yeah, I was yeah, ex- exhausted. Yeah, I was exhausted before, though. That's the problem. Yeah. Like, we, we all get, we, we, we yeah. have so many of these exhausting times, right? Yeah. Just, like, you know, yeah. I, right. I had, like, done. I've had bad accidents, breaking my neck. You know, almost dying, having nine hours of neck surgery. Like I've had all but these eventually, bad things really happen. <laughs> eventually, like, hey, wait a minute, I gotta stop this. I'm getting too old. And then yeah. you were caught yeah, by the feds. So it, it has to stop. Yeah. It has to stop. And there's a part I yeah, think that you know people want to be caught. They want to be found out. And that's when you work on the denial part, which is huge. You have to be able to say, yeah, yeah I'm an addict. I have this problem. And then uh, go into yeah. rehab. But it's the support group, which I think is really important because, yeah, you can be locked up, go to rehab for months and months. But when you eventually are going to come out into the real world and you need that support system yeah. to keep you aligned. And again, it's people, places and things. I think that AA mantra is so true. If you hang around the same people and you do the same things and you go to the same places, guess what? You're going to get fucked up again. And then you got to get you know back into rehab and start that whole cycle. Again, how many times can you start that cycle over and over and over again? The exhaustion uh, yeah. kicks in, but it's that network. You know, once you come out of rehab, that's going to help you to maintain sobriety. And that's, that's yeah, the I, crucial I aspect of it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that's like, even with my, with my foundation now, like the biggest yeah. time, like what we do, what we do is um, we put people like, you know, people into rehab and, and, uh-huh. and the next, and when they come out of treatment, we give them sober how like we have like ninety five people on scholarships where we give them two months or two and a half months to go to the yeah. sober house uh, uh, sober living and give them and pay for them for the first couple of months you know just so they can get because I think that like you just said I think it's the most important time is when we get out of treatment absolutely where we're gonna go right you know me yeah. and Lex and I when we had we had support so we had places to yeah. go but most of these people don't have anything you know they they go in there with they nothing don't. and they when they when they, 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 you know, they've, they've explored, everything's gone, you know? So now, yeah, and now that's what's going to happen when they go to go back to the old neighborhood? That's why the risk of relapse yeah, is so high at that point. Right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Back to the yeah, same thing, the same thing. people. That's what right. That's what happens. Yeah, you can't go back to those people. I mean, that's, you know, it's just, you got to make changes. You got to be willing to do it. That's the hardest thing. I had to be willing. Yeah. When I got arrested that time, I had to be willing to come out to make some changes, you know? So mm-hmm. it was kind of like, I wasn't really sure what was, you know, what direction. I, was. Yeah, I knew what I had to do, but when I came out, then like, you know, obviously Alcoholics Anonymous would save my life basically was there for me. And the yeah. guys came in and helped me and, and they did, yeah. you know, they made, they made, they made my life what it is today. I had to follow yeah. their direction because I needed direction, believe me, you know, because I and was, you were ready I, at that point. Wasn't working. Yeah. At that point you were ready to do yeah, it. I think, you I ready. Ready. I think I was ready, you know, Readiness I, I, I had to be yeah. ready. So it's, yeah. You know, yeah, so I was, I was ready. You know, I, I, was, I guess I was, that was the time, and I had to be ready. And, you know, same thing with Nux. I, oh, I haven't had, I haven't had eight, eight years of clean sobriety. I had a couple little bumps, too. And it's kind of like, you know. Yeah. But most, most you know, for, for the majority, you know, I've had I've had two two slips, but it was, you know, it was for a couple of days here. It wasn't, you know, I never got on runs like I did before where I was like, you know, 
out of control. So I was, you know, I was yeah. basically, it was all, uh, but it's all, you know, it's all good. You know, I had to stay at a day at a time, right? And we're all uh, one day at a time you know, doing the best I can today. So it's been good, you know? Yeah. It's that, again, I look at it that, um, you know, being able to, uh, you know, set those boundaries, have those coping skills that support group. Yeah. That you, um, you learn certainly in the the program and when you go into treatment, there's quite a few things I learned and it is difficult when you get out because you're on your own yeah. and yeah. all of a sudden you're out in that world again and you're like, Ooh, I got to change these people. I got to change these things in these places Habits, and you do. Yeah. And again, if you don't deal with the core issue and I found that out, um, the drinking and the drugs are a symptom of the real problem. Yeah. And I, I truly believe that. And I know it was in my case and I was glad I was able to through some fine therapists to be able to uh, find my way out of that and learn how to cope and deal with my life in, uh, in, in more <laughs> healthy, healthy ways, ways and in turn right. have yeah. healthy re- relationships moving yeah. forward. So, yeah. And people don't understand Okay, it was. Oh, why don't you just stop? Just I stop know. drinking. Grow. Yeah. If it was listen, that easy, everybody would do it, piece. right? If ever, if it was that easy, yeah. everybody and, would just and, stop. Yeah, you it's know, they don't. Easy. People don't not um, sympathize with the addict or the alcoholic. They just don't, and I get that because a lot of people just don't understand it. Yeah, and, yeah, that, um, that's, yeah. That's that's when you live it. Because they see different. it as a, the choices that you're making, and they forget yeah. that there is a genetic component. And some people are more susceptible than other people. And rather than blaming and shaming and locking people up, it's really trying to help them get through this because addiction is a disease, and we need to help people who are suffering from it just and locking them up in prison or jail. It's not going to, it's not the way to do it. Maybe a combination of the two, but Kevin, I want to ask you, you know, if people watching and listening today who might be struggling with this, whether you're a professional athlete or not, or, or whichever limelight you might be in, what would you like to share with them about your story and the most impactful thing that you've learned? Well, I, I think, you know, I think the most important thing for all of us is that, you know, it's, it's there's no shame, really, right? There's no shame. Mm-hmm. There's no, you know, if, you, if you're struggling out there and you're, and, you're, and you're fighting with this addiction thing and you're not sure if you're there or you're not there, or you're there. If you're thinking about it, you're there, right? You're probably there. Yes. You know, if yeah. no, no, most normal people don't think about, like, you know, I got to stop. You know, I got to stop this right. day. I got to stop next day. But, but I think the most important thing is that it can happen to anybody. It doesn't matter, like, if you're a doctor, a lawyer, or you're, or you're a janitor, you know, it doesn't matter. Like if you have this disease and you have this gene, you need, you need to be proactive, you know, and you need to, and, and I think, I think the biggest thing is that, you, you know, you need to be okay with, you know, yourself, okay with being okay. And you can go in and say, mm-hmm. you can talk about it, like talk about these things because it's important. It's, you know, I, I think the most important thing that uh, this whole aspect is that we, we talk about addiction, you know, yes. people can talk about it because, People need to hear that it's okay to be, to, you know, to be an addict right now or be struggling. It's okay to be fucked up. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's like you know, a lot of us do that. You know, it's fine. And most of just, us are, and it's okay, to, right? Yeah, there's yeah. so many different ways, and it's kind of like you know, but I, I, you just you have to, you know, you have to realize that you know there is help there. There's, there's help. People want to help, and that, that's the biggest thing. There's so much help out there, and if you you're willing to you know throw the towel in and say you know what enough's enough. There's so, there's so much help, and there's a way out. That's the biggest thing. There's a way out of this thing, you know, and you don't have to beat yourself to death every day. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to keep doing it. There's a way out, and the way out is, is, is accepting that you're an addict, accepting that you have this disease, that there's a problem, and let's, let's, let's get to the bottom of this. Let's get to work mm-hmm. and, and, and try to get, 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 get yeah. focused because it's not easy yeah. to get sober. Next knows, I know. It's no, not easy. Absolutely not. But, but, but but the results, you know, if you get through that first couple of months, you get through those tough times, you can look back and you see that how much, what, 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 like how bad, how, like what's what. The wreckage. The wreckage, the wreckage and what you had and what you did to yourself. Why couldn't you stop? And when you see yourself stop now, it's like, why couldn't I have done this? Like I had, you know, a you know, normal. But you know what? We can't look in the rearview mirror either. I do it once in a while, but yes. you know we look back and see, fuck, you know, we mess. We really, you yeah. know, we really jam ourselves up pretty good here, you know. No well, question. It's learning from no question. learning from learning from the past and not living there. Um, 
which is vital to building healthy relationships from the inside out, right? Yeah. Yes, as we say. <laughs> yeah, that's the biggest thing. It's, it's, it's yeah. yeah. So talking it's about it, you know, you know, we, I can't. Do yes. That. Nothing without yeah, relationships. We can't do this Sorry, thing alone. No, one, no one can do it alone, right? Yeah, you need yeah. you need to talk to people. You need to, you know, there's there's no way you can do this thing alone. No. And it's having that conversation. I always tell people, you can't fix anything until you're able to talk about it. That's why I think podcasts such as the one we're doing today, and Kevin, thank you for coming on in your time, is to bring awareness. Wow. Wow. Uh, people are hiding today right now watching this. They're ashamed of what they're doing and they're in denial. And if you know somebody and you suspect that they're suffering in silence from some form of addiction, approach them with compassion. It is not to say, oh, you're an addict. I'm watching it, uh, attacking them with what yeah. they're suffering with, but approach them with some compassion, start the conversation and then move forward from there on and, you know, get them into a program if you can. But it all starts with having a compassionate conversation about that with that person. And if it's yourself, you're recognizing yourself in this conversation, then you need to make a phone call, call a close friend, call a family member and share your story. We got the right guy next. We got the right guy for compassion. Our uncle Phil. Our uncle Phil. Oh yeah. <laughs> uncle Phil's the best. Uncle Phil's good. Who is uncle compassion. Phil? Who's guy. uncle Phil? Sorry. Uncle <laughs> Phil is a mutual friend. <laughs> okay. Who helps us. He, he, he will love you and hug you sober. That's what he will do. He'll, he'll hug you sober. He's the best. He's the best. No question Hugs about it. No one like this guy. That's amazing. I gave Hugs him the good. nickname the Hugster because he that. just hugs everybody. Maybe we need to have uh, him know? on, right? Well, we could all use a little oh, hug. Hug you right? sober. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He oh, talked a dog ask. off a meat wagon. Yeah. Barry Reese? Yes, Barry Reese. Come I right in. A couple of easy questions. Since we're so much talking about addiction and everything, I'm going to switch it. What was your highest point in your hockey <laughs> career? The point you look back on, you say to yourself, that was the the high point. The that best. The best point. The best time. You know, I, I, I got to, you know, just the playoffs and winning the first Stanley Cup and just to Pittsburgh, you know, being in that city and, and winning the first Stanley Cup and some of those games, some of those overtime games. I, it's not like the last Stanley Cup game was the best. You know, we won eight to nothing. But some of those overtime games and the games we had to win, there's so many, there's so much happens in those playoff series, you know. And like I remember one of them, Randy Gillen, one of our, he was like a fifth line guy, hadn't played in a couple, jumped on the ice and scored a goal, beat, beat a team in overtime. Like, you know, this is the, the things you remember, like, you know, like it was yesterday. But the, the first Stanley Cup was, you know, coming back into Pittsburgh, you know, after winning that one. It was, it was pretty amazing. How, how did you see? I remember I'm from Pittsburgh. So I yeah. remember we lost two in Boston. And you came back and guaranteed the Penguins were going to win. Yeah. Was it for show, or did you really believe it? You know what? I knew we were going to win, but you know what? I didn't. I didn't say that like meaning like anybody to get the media to grab that. Right? I was so win mad. one for the Gippa. Yeah. yeah, I was so mad. Next, I, I remember mm -hmm. Radiska scored in overtime. I was chasing him down. We were up for that game five three. They tied it five five. Imagine five five. That's awesome stuff. But uh, <laughs> but. but but I remember Raziska scored. Like, I was chasing him. I missed him by, like, a half an inch. The puck went over the line by this much. And, I was like, and we lost in overtime. So I was so mad after the game. I said, we're going to beat these guys. You know, the media, they always like to come to me for a stupid quote once in a while, you know. So it's like, no. that was another one. I said, we're going to beat these guys in four straight. And the next thing you know, it's going around. I didn't even know I said it, to tell you the truth. You know, I was like, uh, but uh, we did. You know, we had, that team was good. You know, we I knew we'd uh, – it's amazing that thought those Boston series. That game five there in Boston when I got four goals. That was that was a yeah, good Yeah, I was insane. You bastard. Yeah, that was a good one. I got three in the first one. Our, our line that was when me, Yager, and Mario were playing together. That line was going pretty good then. Yeah. Uh Kevin, Barry's son, Dylan, played for the Penguins. Dylan Reese. Oh yeah. Yeah, 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 Dylan? yeah. Yeah, Just yeah. A bit, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. That's awesome. It's because he grew up watching you. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. I want to I know what it's like. You explain a little bit of actually being able to play with a guy like Mary Lemieux. I mean, yeah. was, I mean, was it like playing with somebody so unbelievable all the time? It was just. Yeah, he's he was amazing. Like you know what, the most amazing thing I've I've ever seen is when the year he uh, there's one year that he he didn't practice at all because his back was bothering. Mm -hmm. You know, he did not practice once next. Year. You know, if I took two mm -hmm. days off, if I took two days off, I couldn't skate. Right, you were dying. Yeah, <laughs> like me. He didn't practice. He didn't practice at all. Right, 
the whole year. He ended up having 164 points that year. 164 points without practicing. That, that's like it's it's like an amazing thing that I've ever seen in my life, you know. And he, it wasn't like he was in riding a bike every day either, Nux. You know, he was. Uh, yeah. Yeah, he was natural. Getting, he was getting massaged and he was getting the back worked on. He couldn't even tie his own skates. We had a guy in there tying his own tying his skates for him, you know. <laughs> and so, you know, it was just it was just like he'd come in and say, you know, I'm going to play just a power play. He ended up playing 22, 23 minutes, you know. <laughs> he was that's unbelievable. Uh, yeah, it was um, that, that's unbelievable. Not practicing to me. That's some like. In any sport, I've never seen anything anything compared to that. I witnessed it. He never was on the ice, you know, not at all. So last night, I'm talking to uh, Cole Caulfield, yeah. and we're at an event here with the Habs. And Cole yeah. said, you know, they look at some of the older guys there that you know they don't need the practice like they and they don't. They let yeah. some of the older guys now take some days and they it's it's crazy it's so yeah. changed from yeah. you know you, you just said it if i missed a day if yeah. i missed the optional practice i yeah. felt like i was gonna have a bad game yeah but that's it period i, was I wasn't gonna way. play well I, yeah they had the one day off if we took another day off i was dead you know i, I yeah, couldn't yeah. take me a week to get back to like you know, training camp training yeah. camp again i couldn't you know? do it i was like you know it's yeah it's so different these guys yeah and everything's not as monitored. They take these practice. They only can practice 32 minutes. It's like, 30, why 33 minutes? Why Why can you only practice 33 minutes? Why can't you go another 10, you know? Yeah. Like, you know, everything's structured. You know, you got to be in here at this time. It's, yeah, it's different. But different. it's, um, it's different. But, you know, it's it's funny. It's funny, like, my kids look at the goalies now, and they say, our goalies weren't as good. Our goalies are 10 times better than the goalies now when we play. Like, you know, Patrick Waugh and Brodeur and Hasek. Our goalies are way better than the goalies they're playing right now. They get the equipment. <laughs> they get the equipment these guys had. Next. I know, huh? You no, know? That's what right? I said, right? They give, yeah, them, give out all the old timers the goalie equipment these guys are using, you know? They'd be unbelievable. Like, them <laughs> little pads they had. And no. You know, 90, I'm so like, you know, one thing, Kev, I'm surprised I didn't score more goals because they had no equipment. <laughs> I don't think I could, <laughs> I don't think I could score on a guy today with them goddamn pads. I know, I know. My I God. know I can do these guys now. I know. It's fucking shirts are bigger than anything. It's crazy. <laughs> it's insane. Yeah, it's, it's crazy, but. All right, I only have two more questions. I All right, go, Barry. Fire two away. Two more. Back. Go one ahead. One easy one, one hard one. Here's All the hard right. one. Here's the hard one. I mean, you guys talked about sharing and how the locker room is. It's kind of mod show. I mean, you have to be a certain way. Do you think it would be better if you could share more? Or do you think that's just the way of sports? You can't show that vulnerability. You can't show weakness. And you just got to like, you know. Yeah, I don't think I don't think it was ever like, it wasn't a weakness. It wasn't anything. I just think that just the devil, you just don't do it. You know, it's just like, you know, you're not going to say, you know, I'm hurting. Like, I can't believe. I feel like crying. You're not going to do that. You know, you, know, you know, if you feel like crying, you're not going to tell anybody you feel like crying. I want to you know? go home and cry. Yeah, I can't wait to get home and, like, cry for a couple hours by myself. But, but it just never was like that. It just, Barry, it was just kind of like you just, you know, you move on to but the next But do you thing, think right? it would help, Kev, if guys could? Yeah, I think it would help. I think it would help if we could talk about some things, you know. Absolutely. But I just don't know how that could ever happen next, right? How, how like. Like, what are well, we going to sit down after think the game and talk about? It's, well, I would think it's not going to be in the locker room, for sure, when everybody's got their jock strap on, right? No, it's going <laughs> to be Nobody's going to start gonna talking about that. Like a There's, that's what I, we talked about this last time, Chris, that, you know, with these professional yeah. teams, companies, whatever, you've got a dietitian, you've got all these professionals on board, but what yeah. you really need to have on board is a shrink, is a therapist who, you know, you can go and walk into the office. The door is always open. You can just walk in and go out. It's not this big to do that everybody's watching. Oh my God, you got to go somewhere. Just there. Like you'd go see the dietitian. You walk into the therapist's office. You talk about what uh, it is that's bothering you. And that's good. it. An open door yeah. policy, you know, and I'm hoping that through doing more and more of these discussions that, more professional organizations will look at, at mental health as being a very important component of whatever it is going on, whether you're playing hockey, whether you're playing basketball. And even when you're on the road traveling, you know, take the shrink with you because all kinds of shit happens in this journey, whatever, journey, you know, athletic journey you're yeah. on that we need to talk about. And men in particular still today, 2000, almost 2023, we're still not able to talk about those kinds of things. And people ask me like, it is 
a conversation that needs to happen. We need to get away from feeling ashamed, hiding and in denial that men have feelings and we can't talk about them and they don't have emotions. Absolutely, we do. And we need to bring those things to the forefront because the way people start coping, athletes start coping is by using medication, you know, if they're in pain. But what about their emotional pain? The meds will deal with the physical pain, but we need to deal with the emotional pain that often they go together. That's what happens. So there's my, has, you know, selling point. Therapist, therapist, right, therapist, right. get in those offices. Here's one Be for on you. We teams. had a guy. I'm looking for a job that somebody went on. We <laughs> had a guy. <laughs> we had a guy in Boston, Fred Neff. Okay. okay. He was a therapist and you could talk to him. Okay. And cut, and I know one guy that used him. I'm not going to mention any names. Yeah. Talked to him quite a bit. Fred would always look at me and say, hey, all the time. I'm there. Freddie, I'm good. Thank you. See you fucking later. Yeah. See you fucking Fred. You're not going to get in my fucking head and tell me that maybe I should slow down fighting or watch what, you know, you know fuck off, Fred. I want nothing to do with you that I am doing what I do and I know how to do it. I don't need yeah. you to fucking help me through it. And that's how I was with Fred Neff. Now, I love the guy. He was yes. a great guy, yeah. but I never fucking once sat down with him and said, hey, But listen, Freddie. it's starting to change that culture within whatever yeah, organization. No, this is different is, now. I get is, it. It's yes, different, different now. That was yeah, way back these when. These kids are different. It's you know, different. It, it, I, I get it. Well, it's, it's still a tough environment. But let's, let's yeah, talk think. about a different part of that, too. Maybe, you know, uh, I would think, you know, from my experience as a shrink and, you know, working with men, they're much more comfortable with having a female perhaps in that role because we are nurturers. We are mothers. Right. We, nobody's yeah. putting their, True. we have to put our dick on the table to be crass and start measuring. You know, yeah. guys have a very yeah. hard time going to another guy and being all Measure vulnerable. The penis. But when, yeah, exactly. Right. You don't have to do that with women. I mean, I'm not dissing male therapists. They're totally important to and represent all kinds of other things. But in terms of building, and making ourselves vulnerable, men have an easier time. And I can probably back this up with data, talking to a female therapist. And it doesn't have to be this big taboo. And, you know, I, I got to share a story. I once went to a company that, you know, something was going on. Somebody died and they wanted to bring me in to do some grief counseling. And they like literally hid me in the back of the building hallway. Like I was some dirty little secret. And then people <laughs> snuck in like, oh, my God, I got, I got, snuck in and snuck out. I'm like, this is bullshit. You're on the one yeah. hand saying, hey, everybody go and talk to her. She's here because, you know, you got we got this issue going on at the same time you're sending this double message that we've hidden her and it's a dirty little secret i think we need to just be open and honest that we are all in some way fucked up in our heads and we're dealing with all kinds of bullshit whatever sport we're playing whatever yeah. we're doing in life that it's okay we can talk about it and there's a therapist in the building room 205 go and see her uh -huh. <laughs> if she's not hidden not or he's room. not <laughs> hidden just go down the hallway <laughs> hey anita not everybody can afford a an electric fucking vehicle, okay? Last one. My what last, last one for Barry. One more, <laughs> one more for sons. Barry. Two sons that both went to Yale. They oh, both played yeah. hockey. I mean, that's pretty unbelievable. That's an amazing I mean, how do you accomplishment. How a father? I mean, if, and you have a third one too, I'm sure. I don't know what much more. But. Yeah. No, that was that was great. That was both of yeah, you. One just graduated there and he's... um. He's playing the minor leagues with Seattle's team, and then uh, I have a junior there right now. So and I, and, um, so yeah, that was it's pretty amazing. Those two, you know. That's, Congratulations! You know, that's, yeah, that's my ex-wife has a lot to do with that. She's pretty smart. Like you know, my brain, me, my brain isn't like you know that smart. But, <laughs> but I think the biggest thing about those guys is get once you get into Yale, it's just like any other school, right? It's a great degree though. And like my older guy, like you know, he's. He's pretty set up when he gets once you know, I think he'll finish hockey pretty soon here and he can uh, you know, those guys take care of each other. So it's it's yeah, it's, it's great. Those guys I am I'm so lucky with my I have three older kids, my daughter's doing some finance stuff and uh and That's uh, awesome, Kevin. Well, well it sounds awesome like you're a great father. Good, you know, so you ha you have something to do with it. It sounds yeah, like you're a great got, father. Yeah, I had some I got I got a little seven year old now too. Imagine I got a twenty five, <laughs> twenty four. That's a lot of work. In seven. Wow. Okay, that's a lot uh, that, of that's work. That's when I need to see a therapist, right? <laughs> hey, we all need one. It's okay, including myself. Nah. <laughs> It's no, okay. he's uh, it's just a lot of fun. He's he's a little nut, but it's it's good. Yeah, that's a lot of work. Yeah, it's good all for good. You. 
Oh, you know? good. It's a lot of work. You know, you don't know, have to put the legs up too much, but it is what it is, you know. <laughs> good stuff. Yeah. Hey, Kevin. <laughs> Kevin, um, I, I want to thank you for joining us today. I really yes, appreciate it, buddy. And um, yeah, it I'm glad you're doing well.